Welcome to Live Players, where political scientists and strategists Sam Oberia and I discuss the key individuals with the power to alter our current society. Every week, we provide analysis of the news and case studies of live players, as well as key institutions and technologies that make up the global power landscape. Let's dive in. Hey, Samo. Hey, Eric. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm happy we get to have a call. So I think that uh, discussing European immigration. Yeah, I think it was the, the effect that immigration has, particularly in Europe, and how these countries should should think about it. Well, first, why don't we give kind of a background for people who are not as not as familiar with what exactly is happening in Europe in terms of, you know, people are often, we hear a lot in the U.S. about our own border challenges or challenges with illegal immigration during this past administration. But in Europe, there's been a more sustained sort of challenge for, for some time now, it seems. So wh- why don't you um, expound on wh- what exactly are the, ch- are the challenges some of these countries are, are, are facing? And then we could talk about why, wh- why it's possible that mass immigration won't, won't save Europe and, and you know, wh- what are some of the more in the weeds things that can be done about it? At this point, I think we have 20 years of media on the challenges of integration and multiculturalism in Europe, especially in countries such as the United Kingdom, France, and to some extent, Sweden and Germany. This is news making stuff because it results in very clear and obvious public disorders, right? Like the burning of cars in Paris or the unrest in the city of Malmo in Sweden. And there is also the very explosive and at times damning topic of crime in the United Kingdom, organized crime, where the Rotterdam scandal was really something spectacular, where it was basically underage prostitution carried out in this British city, basically enabled by local authorities, enabled by local politicians. And this became kind of this publicly known sort of mark of shame, where the question is, well, this isn't inherently a consequence of immigrations, but why are we tolerating this in these societies? Now, of course, in more recent weeks, we've seen unrest in Britain that according to official British statements, it's all coming from, you know, far right or right wing extremists protesting the murder of, you know, basically flame, you know, bringing the country into flames after the murder of three three young girls. I think they were, you know, like six, seven or something like this. So a very heinous crime. But, you know, the uncensored feeds on X.com show that there are, of course, also rioters with machetes and Palestinian flags. So, you know, it is definitely a mess. It is a political mess and there's no way around it. And I'm happy to address it directly. Now, just because acknowledging that there is a massive problem, you know, this doesn't mean that, I don't know, say the far right is correct or that the far left is correct and there is no problem. I think the real issue here is that fundamentally Europe is now a powder keg in a way that perhaps the United States is not. And part of it is to say something that is very relevant, the cultural difference that existed between very pacified sort of European societies and like more clannish, more tribal societies of places like Somalia, Afghanistan, and so on. And the challenge in assimilation is a twofold challenge that Europe is failing. I'm already granting the premise that some form of assimilation is necessary. And of course, the truth of the matter is there is no assimilation without the transformation of both cultures. It would be hard to deny that even in the U.S., where Irish-American and Italian-American immigration was wildly successful, this, this, this did not change national character. And even in a subtler way, in modern-day France, I think there is a stronger influence of Italian culture than people might be aware of, because in the 19th century, there was a today not very well-known, but significant period of mass immigration from Italy to France And of course, assimilation was so rapid that you barely wouldn't know it it existed, right? It was the same as, say, assimilation from uh, European countries to Argentina. Today, no one in Argentina speaks German or Italian, not really, no more than they do in Texas or in New Jersey. But that in the process does change and shape national culture. So even when I say assimilation, 
it actually goes both ways. It's a mutual transformation. And then there's a tricky political negotiation of what, where does that boundary of assimilation lie? In the early 2000s, in the war on terror era, the flashpoint in Europe, which you know has a strange mix from the American perspective of socially liberal values and socially conservative values, the flashpoint was basically women's rights. There's a lot of discourse on that. I don't necessarily want to go on that. It's the question of like, where should a hijab be mandatory? Where should be allowed? Should there be gender separated swimming teams? Or where is se gender segregation necessary? Where's gender integration necessary? These were all topics that in Europe, long before, you know, they entered the US discourse of um, trans rights and so on, they were already there, though in a the different context of people with very different social expectations coming into the school system, the medical system, the legal system, and then negotiating what are acceptable boundaries, right? And what are things that should or should not be tolerated, which is what the other side, that let's say socially conservative part of European society was actually arguing in the early 2000s, essentially to sustain or, or retain kind of these unisex or gender egalitarian norms that had become standard in in post 1960s Europe, uh, especially in places like Sweden, Denmark, to a lesser extent, Germany. So the challenges, like I said earlier, are twofold. There's first the challenge of what are we all assimilating to, because it's never just the assimilation of one group. And the second challenge is this, the migrants are nominally coming to address labor shortage, yet there's mass youth unemployment in Europe. And actually, there is mass unemployment among the, say, asylum seekers at least, less so among the economic immigrants, mm -hmm. but mass unemployment in the second generation, right? When we talk about youth unemployment in Europe, a substantial fraction of the youth are the children of immigrants. So there is something deeply wrong with European job creation and the integration of everyone into the labor market, but it becomes extra difficult if you're showing up from a totally random part of the world, your life is much better materially, even if you just go directly and lean on the social safety net of the country. And maybe you go, uh, go to the social safety net after having done your best to find a job, but part of the inflexibility of the European system, which is there for natives, Honestly, it's probably harder to get a job as an immigrant in Europe than it is in the United States. Also, because once you're hired, it's just much harder to fire you. And necessarily, the process of assimilation, I would argue, happens mostly in the workplace in the United States. I would argue that that's the key driver. It's way more important than schools. So when European countries talk about like, oh, school reforms and have these like, let's say, center right proposals, that there should be a stronger emphasis on, on in France, for example, laïcité, which is like the stronger version of secularism they have. It's not just that there's a wall between state and religion. It's like, it's truly the state is actively secular. And while no one's religious freedoms are supposed to be compromised, the state actively promotes secular culture as part of the reason of state. So that's been the traditional French uh, perspective on things for most of the 20th century kind of a consequence of their, you know, derivative of their 18th century sort of liberal Republican values. They're sort of like kind of, let's call it authoritarian enlightenment or like authoritarian Republican enlightenment, right? A kind of top-down refined approach to managing public culture and France's brand and influence in the world, which sometimes backfires as currently we saw with the Olympic opening ceremony I guarantee you that was well-funded and I guarantee you that was an attempt by France to be seen as cutting edge, but I think they slightly misjudged the moment. I actually think that if five or six years ago they'd done this, people would maybe consider it stunning and brave and currently people were just like, well, this isn't done very well, but it is an example of the kind of cultural marketing that France is known for. And that's internationally, but domestically, it has positive visions for what the model French citizen should be that are 
if anything, as extensive or much more extensive than what would go into the concept of what is a good American, which is something that, of course, has been discussed, debated, fought, contested over for what, like 150 years, right? Like back to Teddy Roosevelt's sort of hyphenated American critique to the sort of like Statue of Liberty poem to the all of this, right? Post 1960s civil rights and so on. Europe, to a much greater extent than what Americans might realize, tried multiculturalism, which was the view that, oh, you know, actually, maybe the kids will have better outcomes if public schooling allows for instruction in native language, if we respect this, the customs and so on. And the view was, well, maybe these cultures can coexist side by side, each forming their own community without, you know, there being an apartheid or something like this, just a self-organized set of interlocking norms. You know what, if you propose this in 1991, I might even consider that, you know, maybe this could even work. And if there's e some amount of economic prosperity, it semi worked in London, but it didn't work in the rest of the UK. And that's the reason why you have this dysfunctional sort of process that was in a way in Europe, a failed experiment to bypass the problem of not having a culture that even knows how to assimilate people, does not know how to negotiate the transformation of the parent culture when the minority culture is assimilated, because that sometimes takes very illiberal means. To be concrete, in the 19th century, Gaelic languages were suppressed in the United Kingdom through the school system. You were punished actively if you didn't speak English. That's why Britain is now English speaking to a significant degree, right? There would be many, many more Gaelic speakers. And in France, regional languages like Breton and Occitan and so on, and even Basque, actually Basque exists in France, not just Spain, were a sort of suppressed through, through similar measures through the school system. In the US, you can argue that the school system is somewhat important for assimilation, but I think that might be the crux of the difference between Europe and the United States. I think in the US, assimilation was always done at the workplace, right? Both any demands on English, any demands on propriety, and so on. And I think in Europe, it's sort of like the workplace bent backward to respect diversity. There was no idea of how to do assimilation. There weren't that many jobs. The jobs are politically super locked down and contested. And on a net, it did not balance the budget of the welfare states. There was a subtle change that happened, by the way. And even in Europe, there are success stories and failure stories. For example, on a net, I would argue that Turkish immigration into Germany has turned out to be much less of a problem than might have been assumed. And that the culture is like at this point, you know, fairly assimilated. There's still crazy problems. Like, for example, the Turkish ultranationalist organization, the Grey Wolves, will sometimes beat up Kurdish rights protesters in Germany. So it's this really strange transportation of both the Kurdish and Turkish conflict to Germany. And, you know, the German police were, of course, tasked with, you know, understandably preventing the rise of far right extremism and in theory also maintaining law and order. I think they just sort of stand back in confusion and are not sure who they're supposed to arrest. Like there's this seems extreme behavior, but it doesn't match this sort of stereotype of like, you know, far right versus like, you know, like minority groups or whatever. And, you know, I'm not, I would say that the difference in Germany for why let's say it's much it was done much better than the recent waves of refugees coming from africa and the arab world was because germany was an ascendant economic power when the first gastarbeiters came when guest workers came from the former yugoslavia and when they started coming from turkey the workplace assimilation happened almost accidentally but Europe imperceptibly shifted the arguments from labor shortages of an overheated and growing industry to taxpayers that will pay for a welfare state with an inverted pyramid. Like that was actually a change in the arguments about immigration that imperceptibly happened through the 1990s. In the 60s and 70s, the arguments for initially opening it 
were all concrete labor shortages. This will help economic growth. There's still people who make this more abstract argument. They won't say necessarily that there's a labor shortage, but they will say that, oh, evidence shows that immigration helps economic growth. And then there's the other side of, well, we are a radically aging society, which is true. The welfare states and the social democratic model are unsustainable with a total fertility rate in the range of 1.3 to 1.7. Also true, right? A smaller generation cannot pay for the retirement of a larger generation. And if you make them pay for the retirement of a larger generation that preceded them, then the generation that succeeds them will be even smaller since you've kind of taxed parenting out of existence through both direct and indirect means. So it's a compounding problem. It might seem that immigration is a valid way to cut that Gordian knot, but it really isn't, right? If you think through the politics of this, the politics of social democracy were always super nationalist. There's very hard to have an internationalist argument for social democracy. Social democracy rests on there being a shared community of values and meaning where, okay, perhaps your work in a strictly economic sense in Sweden today, it doesn't actually make sense to work. But in a country with the Protestant work ethic, well, you just feel really ashamed among all your friends if you stayed on welfare for longer than you need to. And you're supposed to show your personal worth and character through work. Meanwhile, if you don't like or value Swedish society, you have nothing to prove to them. Why should you work in the formal economy? You can be unemployed. And perhaps actually, if your community cares about work, maybe you just work in an untaxed way, in a way outside of the regulations, right? The two are not even mutually exclusive as long as you appear unemployed on paper. So the creation of the common community almost necessarily must happen or if you had a true multicultural society, all of the multicultural societies composing it would have to have basically a Protestant work ethic. And that's a hell of a social engineering challenge. I have no idea how to make that happen. I don't know. I don't think anyone does, right? And if you started picking and choosing cultures, have like a committee of anthropologists to be like, oh, we're going to, you know, this group has the internal social structure to replace a formal compensation and they'll work anyway, even if we don't have very high salaries for high performance. There's no way a government committee could get that right. And if it did get it right, it, we would start asking extremely uncomfortable questions about our global cultural diversity and what are the things that lead to success or not. So it's also politically unacceptable on unlike, not politically, ideologically unacceptable. Like people don't want to think about this stuff. They don't want to know it. And a result of this has been that voting is devolving in Europe when it's still a minority position. The politics are a little bit similar to America, where you could see the right drifting to like a more libertarian approach to things. Arguably, the UK Independence Party is an example of this. Then you have like the reactionary response, which is like, well, actually, we are a nation state. The purpose of the welfare state was to sort of make, you know, our home our people's home to make it nice. This was actually the slogan that brought social Democrats to power in Sweden from the 1930s to 1950s. There was this concept of like, you know, a people's home, a home for the people, which people, well, in theory, the Swedish people, right? Uh, they were supposed to take care of each other like it's a big extended family. So that concept, you sometimes have a reversion to that concept. And on the other side, it starts being this kind of strange, well, the only problem is people complaining about it. Why are you complaining about being taxed? Why are you complaining about being policed by a different standard than what these other communities are? If you only stopped complaining, GDP would go up and all would be well. But all is not going to be well, because once you reach the tipping point, it does devolve into a naked tribalistic spoil system. And then you don't have a failure of democracy. Well, you go from a functional democracy to a dysfunctional democracy. This is a significant problem in modern African states and modern uh, Middle Eastern states. It's not so much a problem in Latin America. They have different dysfunction. But the core problem is 
different tribal groups will basically just vote for economic favoritism for their sectors of society. Eventually, you have a situation where Kurdish nationals and uh, where Tur Turkish Germans and Kurdish Germans and Arab Germans and German Germans are just voting for spoils redistribution. And this will result in the looting of the central institutions and a collapse in trust in not just policing, not just prison, not just education, but the very concept of the welfare state. Like, let's put it this way. I think that the politics of saving the welfare state through immigration are destined to abolish the welfare state, but also the more nationalist approach of, well, we will save the welfare state through cutting off immigration. It's not going to work either. So in other words, I think the social democratic experiment has been run and it turns out you can only run social democracy with a young, rapidly growing population that has, you know, a high degree of, there's a lot of labor demand because the economy is also growing. So it, it did work. It's no longer working. I think this is the true cause of divergence between America and Europe. I think it's, let's say 40% sclerosis, but 60% graying. So a different kind of sclerosis, biological rather than institutional. I think Europe is just older than America and it's starting to show for the same reason that Japan stagnated. I don't even think the Japanese model was exhausted. We just ran out of Japanese workers. Well, is, isn't that the best argument for, for immigration? I mean, I know you mentioned the employment, you know, the, the you still have unemployment, so it won't solve that. But on the consumer side, you know, you need more people to more young people to to buy stuff and and, and balance out the the demographic situation. You know, I can't imagine. You know, on the consumer side, uh, a lot of these economies are export economies, right? So their goal is the global consumer, not the German consumer or the span or you know the swedish consumer or the japanese consumer if we take east asia as an example right so they're already selling to the whole world when the world can afford it and then controlling for things like tariffs or lack of free trade and some examples let's at least say that for the sake of argument you know the consumer base that you can access under relatively free trade conditions for german goods it's probably like 900 million people uh, for Japanese goods, it's probably like 900, uh, 900 million people too, though in a different configuration, right? Germans can in theory sell to all of the EU plus a few other favorable trade treaties. That's already a big population of consumers. If you're funding your state in this sort of German Swedish export model, it becomes a bit trickier if you're funding it on the sort of French or a British model where the domestic demand is like such a big factor. And to be fair, even in Germany, domestic demand is a factor. It's just not providing the economies of scale needed for some of these uh, front runner companies. And these front runner companies, because they're in a way favored by the states in question, they also are, they don't mind paying as much taxes. We could call this the Swedish model. Uh, taxing exports of champion companies to fund social democracy is like one way to, to think about Sweden. It is a question of to what extent can these companies truly make use of talent and to what extent are these countries attracting talent? I think that again, in countries that are the peak of world economic productivity, you can go out of your way to attract the best and brightest. And then after that, you can go attract the doctors of the world or whatever you want. But I think that's not the way the immigration system is structured currently in Europe. They're still working out their equivalent of the green card, the blue card, the bureaucratic details of the EU system there are still constantly being debated. I think the answer for why the immigration doesn't quite work to sustain, let's say, the Japanese or the German model is twofold. One, the countries lack social technology of assimilation and lack a political system that could negotiate what the new natural culture would be without causing basically resentment and a transition to a, a low trust society. It's number one. 
And number two, uh, for the very best talent, they are outcompeted by the United States. So the gains of solving problem one successfully are actually less than they would be for the US. I note that, again, the, the problem is partially just how difficult the assimilation lift is. How big is the cultural delta? There has been very little problem with the massive wave of Ukrainian refugees, which is partially a demographic one. There are no young men coming from Ukraine. All the young men are fighting. It's women and children. There's no spike in violence. There's like an immediate need to sort of like assimilate in the environment and so on. And the demographics of migration from North Africa, Africa, the Middle East, it skews male, right? It just skews male. And if you have lots of young men, the young men are much more prone to violence than young women. It's a very well-established statistical differential. And it's also clearly established that they come from societies with higher rates of violence. And I think that's, it's something we should just, we should consider how much more difficult it is to get people to buy into this system. Like, I'm not sure I could ever assimilate to the Japanese salaryman norms. So Eric, I'm not sure I could ever be a productive and useful employee at a major Japanese corporation if I was expected to do the same thing the Japanese workers are. Maybe I could be a highly paid external advisor. Maybe I could do business with them, provide them something from my own company but I don't know whether I could assimilate to the Japanese model. So could you like, who can, like, it's actually a high bar and in a way in Japan, it makes sense. They're kind of raised from birth in stuff that is pre-building them to enter this kind of objectively speaking, insane workplace, right? Hey everybody, Eric here with a word from our sponsors. Fast forward to the end of 2024. Think about your goals. What can you do right now to give yourself the best chance of succeeding? If learning a new language is on your list, you absolutely need to check out Babbel. Babbel offers a range of learning tools, self-study app lessons, live classes, and even podcasts, which have always been my favorite way to learn. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel isn't just a game to kill time and make you feel like you're learning a language. It's not overly academic or rigid either. It's all about learning language for the real world. Babbel stands out because it's designed by real people using a modern conversational teaching approach. It's not always easy, nothing worth doing ever is, but it's straightforward and designed to help you start speaking in just three weeks. With Babbel, I was able to brush up on my intermediate Spanish to ramp up for travel to Argentina last year and was able to set clear goals based on how much time each week I wanted to practice. Join millions of Babbel language learners across all age groups. Here's a special limited time offer for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only at babbel.com slash Torenberg. That's babbel.com slash Torenberg, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash Torenberg. Rules and restrictions may apply. The tech world turns to the Brave browser for its unbeatable privacy protections. But did you know that Brave also has a private ad platform? Brave Ads offers first-party targeting, and it's been cookie-less since day one, so you can relax while third-party tracking cookies disappear from the web. Today, millions of people turn to ad blockers to avoid being tracked and pestered online. But Brave's new ad model aligns incentives for users and advertisers. Users earn rewards for viewing ads, which they can save, spend, or pass along to their favorite creators. And advertisers score points for respecting user privacy, generating ROI without invasive tracking. So whether it's high impact announcements on the new tab page or keyword targeted ads in Brave Search, Brave Search offers diverse, private, future-proof ad formats for all your business goals. Join the future of advertising at brave.com slash ads. Mention Turpentine to get 25% off your first campaign. Yeah. And, and so getting to the, we, we've outlined the challenges we, we've outlined sort of, you know, why it's exciting to folks, but also why, why it's challenging to actually do. If, if you could pick any specific country, you know, country of one as an example, but like 
what do you, if you were advising these, these, these governments or these leaders who are tasked with figuring out how to, how to make this work and how much should we even accept in the first place or what should our approach be to, to immigration? What, what would you advise or if easier to predict, like, what, what do you think is likely to happen? Like there's a lot of tension right now. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, I think I would be tracking very closely the social cohesion of the society and to the extent to which high trust is load bearing for the functioning of things like national healthcare systems or the civil service or equilibria where personally you don't need to riot or take revenge when someone is killed from your community because you actually just trust the police to do their job. Note, this is literally what's happening in Britain. About 20 to 25% of the population supports even the violent protests when asked because they no longer believe uh, policing will do its job. So we could make a provocative analogy between current British protests and BLM, right? One can easily argue the African-American community in the US in 2020 did not expect American police to do their job, but to be, if anything, a hazard. Whether that's true or not, that's a different question, but I'm talking about perception. And I think in Britain, it's just kind of true the functional nature of this mechanism that was keeping these societies peaceful is gone. And I think this is a very dangerous situation and it requires some soul searching, some reform. And I think they just wish they could adopt the Singaporean model, but I'm not sure they can. So the first advice would be, look, Singapore shows you can have what is proportionately for such a small city and country mass immigration. But you know what it requires? It just requires like caning people uh, for chewing gum and requires sometimes, you know, executing drug dealers or executing human traffickers, right? These are very harsh measures. Historically speaking, this is probably how Britain or Germany or France were pacified in the 18th century from a high private violence equilibria to a low public uh, private violence equilibria. The transition was bridged by public violence, that is the violence of the criminal justice system. I just will call it violence because technically it is what it is. I'm not talking here about justice. I'm just talking about how do you maintain that? And then once you have that pacification, once you have the pacification of crime and the state has grabbed sort of legitimacy of justice, then something like a civil war or an insurgency becomes much harder to fathom, right? Insurgencies, of course, can happen in places where legitimacy is very low. Even in the European context, you you did see things like Basque terrorism in Spain or IRA terrorism, you know, advocating for the independence or merger of Northern Ireland, Ireland with Ireland. And that was because of low legitimacy in those regions. So first off, I would make sure that all communities of the nation, including the what happens to be the demographic majority and what happens to be the majority of taxpayers feel that the state is legitimately fulfilling the functions that they always trusted it to right so that's step one and it starts with security right violence is perhaps the monopoly on violence is perhaps the lowest rung of the maslow's pyramid of functional government and then step two is you know there are well, various ways to do it i I think there are things to say about free speech where it is a good approach to mitigating many of these issues. But in full honesty, I have to admit that in Singapore and China, you don't actually have more free speech. And then at least in Singapore's case, the lack of the free speech does not seem to result in a lot of oppression of any particular group. So let's say in Singapore, the hate speech laws work as they should. In Europe, they do not work as they should. They are now used to police critiques of the relevant governments. So in fact, it is enabling dysfunction rather than preventing violence. It is enabling the dysfunction of one-sided violence until it's intolerable. And then it's kind of this critique of the general population, a contempt of the general population, where it's sort of like, you know, there's a there's a saying, you know, this beware, this animal is vicious. It defends itself when attacked. So, you know, I think this is how this this feeling is. It's a feeling of contempt for 
the general population because they don't, in the mind of the technocrats, if only they were more calm, eventually all of these problems they're complaining about would be solved. But that's not actually true. The young men who come to the country who are unruly and perhaps have different standards of what constitutes something like sexual assault, well, they might grow old and they might actually learn better and they might regret what they did in their youth. That totally can happen on an individual life. I think we're in denial, by the way, how much this learning process happens and enculturation happens and how big these initial gaps are. But then there'll be more young men from elsewhere. That's the whole point of the Ponzi scheme, right? The mass immigration equilibrium has to be paired with very strict, almost disciplinary public order where people will abandon the commons and not care about the commons. And for a lot of these countries, these are high density places. You have nowhere to flee urban dysfunction in Singapore. It's a city state. You have nowhere to flee in the Netherlands, right? It has like a, an insanely high population density. Belgium has a higher population de density than Bangladesh does. So there's no version of this where you can just use economic stratification and sort of people buy their way out of dysfunction by going to suburbs. You just, you just actually have to be, you just actually have to be a very law and order type of person. Sorry, not person, policy, government. And I don't think we really have will for that in Europe. It doesn't work with our ideology. It kind of works in East Asia. I think, I think this is how uh, Singapore deals with it. This is how Hong Kong will deal with it or did deal with it, you know, before it ceased to be an independent political entity. Uh, but I don't think this matches our values very much in the Western world, where it's a stronger emphasis on freedom or a stronger emphasis on just trusting people to do the right thing and expecting of people to do the right thing. So my basic advice would be, we do have to go as far as possible on the law and order question. We cannot allow violence against a minority group, but we cannot shield minority groups from criticism. And we certainly cannot shield government officials from criticism. Like that should just be a category of protected speech. So even without abolishing European uh, so-called hate speech laws, I would literally make an exception that hate speech laws do not apply when speaking of a politician. I'm sure this will result in some bigotry that is unfortunate and unjustified. But I think actually it would be an interesting corrective measure because, you know, public officials should be exposed in a way to the critiques of the public. The second, you know, the second and the third one, you have to be much more economically liberal. If you're solving this, you will just have to become at least a more neoliberal state not, if not more a libertarian state, like we already described why it can't quite be libertarian, right? It has to be bizarrely, very politically authoritarian, very constrained in a way, culturally authoritarian, but economically liberal. And that's like a hard little balancing act to crack. How do you empower and make cost-effective bureaucracies on setting culture, education, law and, law and order, and then you turn around and you're like, well, but the economy, we're going to leave it do whatever it needs to do. And we're not going to regulate it too much environmentally. And we're not going to make it too difficult to fire people. And again, how are you going to sell this to either the original, but the, the native population who are the bulk of your current voters or your future population that has come to already rely on the welfare state? There is no constituency for truly abolishing the welfare state here. It is just being continually made more dysfunctional, more delegitimized, more insoluble, and, and, and you know, it, more bankrupt. But it's never actually reaching a point where the machinery is abolished. So it's this really crazy thing where the taxes stay high and the quality of the public services goes down. And if you ask the voters to ax it, they're not going to want to because they still all expect it and want it. So, and finally, I think you, you have to make it happen 
you have to have immigration come at a pace. You have to get fertility and immigration to reach a pace where you are not importing people, you know, you're not importing people to replace the people who were never born, but you are importing people to assist the growth of an overheating economy. So in other words, once you have above replacement fertility, once you get economic growth around three to four or 5%, then a uh, hundred thousand or 200,000 of people a year is a completely different social and civilizational and political phenomena than when you have one to 2% paper growth, but actually in reality, a recession. And when your average age of workers, even with hundreds of thousands of people a year goes up one year, you know, the average age goes up one year for every three or four years that pass. So it's really like a complete disaster in terms of political economy. You have to be a growing dynamic society to accept immigrants. Accepting immigrants while being a dysfunctional, broken society enhances and makes the dysfunction worse. That would be my like one line is sort of immigrants make functional societies stronger. Immigrants make dysfunctional societies weaker and worse. And I think that's one of the core places where I would fight the economists and disagree with them because the economists are ignoring the political economy that allows all of these fabulous policies that they imagine and want to draw on their graphs. And imagine, imagine if one was listening to this conversation so far, how might they respond? Do you think that they would underappreciate the political economy um, aspects or do you think that they would differ on um, the assessment of, of the impact of the immigrants on, on the political economy or take, I don't know, Brian Kaplan or Noah Smith or, you know, a pro-immigrant, very smart economist, if, if they were listening to this conversation, how might you expect them to respond? Well, first off, they would say the problem of a stagnant economy is not America's problem. But I don't think they would grant the view that the voters will be stuck in their way. I think they would argue that if we only educate the voters enough, most voters will start to think like economists. And if most voters thought like economists, well, then there would be no problem. And I'm like, well, my dear economist, do you know who thinks this way? Priests think this way. Priests are like, you know, if most voters thought as priests, Christian democracy would work great. Who else thinks this way? Well, socialists, if most social, if most voters thought like socialists do, all problems would be solved. Environmentalists, et cetera, et cetera. You see how it goes, right? I don't think there is an indoctrination mechanism that would result in this. And at the end of the day, I don't even want economics to be taught as a national ideology. I think this would hurt the science of economics, even if it would make the growth of the economy better, because anything that has to be taught in the sort of natural national ideological curricula becomes a creed, not a science. You would think that people would have been instructed a little bit by the example of the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, everyone was thought very firmly some economic principles. They just happened to become more and more deranged and more and more incorrect. And the same thing would sort of happen with any sort of mass propaganda campaign or mass education campaign that aimed to do this. Now, an alternate smarter version of this would be, oh, but you know, while democracy is important, in reality, our political mix only involves a very small element of democracy, right? They would say they would point to things like rule of law. They'd point things to like elites generally making better decisions, which is, you know, you know, this would be maybe a more Richard Hanania argument, but I'm sure Brian Kaplan would agree with it. And maybe No Smith would agree with it too, that, you know, if, if the well-educated people believe economics, not because they've been indoctrinated into it, but because they thought about it and realized that, oh, actually this is economically correct. They can sort of overrule the opinion of the voters and the voters' opinions just don't end up mattering. Well, the voters notice. They notice and they start to hate their own country. And you can then try to shame them for being unpatriotic, for hating their own country. Do you know what? That's, that's not going to actually work. They're going to double down on it. And you have no idea what happens when a counter elite shows up that wants to tap into that. And I think that's actually dangerous. I think that will, it's the worst thing that can happen. You know what? Civil war is the worst thing that can happen for a country's economic growth.
right? So, so really, I think that there, some of these countries truly are at risk of long-term civil war. I don't think the U.S. is for a variety of reasons that I've written about. Maybe if the situation were radically worse, it would be. But, you know, I think that if we look at, you know, if we look at a place like France or a place like Italy or Britain, run this process for 10 or 15 more years, uh, the process of a ever more corrupt and oppressive let's call it national security apparatus where the intelligence agency and the police are weaponized basically against the, the population and where the balance of who has more young men and who is more emboldened to pursue violence just keeps getting more and more even. And there is still other ideologies such as, you know, politically you have Islamization, which is still a problem in France and Britain, even though in America it turned out to not be a problem, right? In America, it's just fine. We can, everyone just lives together peacefully. I think that there would be real calls for revolution. And, you know, these are very dysfunctional states. Once the police oppression breaks, I think you could easily see self-organized terrorist groups and insurgent groups and will there be foreign powers that want to crack up Britain and France? Yes, there will be, okay? The world is actually becoming not multipolar in the sense that U.S. pure hegemony or power is ending, but in the sense that there are going to be many, many powers around the world that are very rich and that have interests that might want to sponsor problems in Britain or France. People are now sort of talking about Russian meddling in Western European politics. Well, Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But will China in 20 or 30 years? Probably. And you know, even India, for now Western allies, 60 years from now, how do they feel? Saudi Arabia, if Saudi Arabia switched to team China, how much damage could they cause to Europe? Simply through their existing lines of influence. And so on and so on, right? And of course, people might sponsor, you know, British or French British, British and French, French extremists, not just Arab, French extremists or whatever. Like I'm actually just pointing to like a kind of a horror scenario of the kind of demographics driven balkanization of the few middle sized European countries. And I think that could happen. I think that could happen. And a few percentage points of that in expectation, that's all you need really. And then the side effects such as the the damage of the culture war, right? The culture war over this question has already destroyed European universities and it's going to start hurting their scientific output. And it's already crippled economic policies and it's already crippled the ability to have public discourse. So even if democracy is a small part of how Western societies work, democracy has been suspended because they cannot, we cannot deal with the democratic results that come down the pipeline. And we're now already in a political war between the democratic elements of society, the autocratic ones and the oligarchic ones, because things like Brexit are great examples of basically almost constitutional level crises, political crises triggered by popular discontent. We're, we're just getting to time here. I think this is a great place to, 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 to wrap. This is a great overview of, of, of immigration and, and some of the challenges and opportunities it's, it's brought in Europe. I, I love the, the takeaway of it makes functional societies stronger and, and doesn't work for dysfunctional societies. I think that's a really fascinating sort of framework I hadn't considered before. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, perfect. Un until next time. Thanks for listening to Live Players. Please subscribe, leave a review, and check out Samo's excellent newsletter, The Bismarck Brief, for more rigorous analysis of key individuals, institutions, or industries. Live Players is a production of Turpentine, the podcast network behind Econ 102 with Noah Smith and Moment of Zen.